wanting to think I'm going to do it all again, but I'm going to do it. Um, every five years ago, every five years ago, every five years or so, it seems, um, Lauren has asked me to do one of these um, addresses. Uh, I did, I've done two in the past, so ten years then. Um, and I'm thinking if the pattern holds true, the next time I do one, I'll be 41, which is <laughs> a little bit daunting. Um, yeah. um, so, uh, Lauren asked me to do this about two weeks ago. And um, so I said, sure, he was going to be away, as he said, um, in the end he isn't, but um, here I am. And he said, you know, just talk about um, life, like what it's like for you and, and you know, living with um, having, having MS in our family and, and you know, just some of, the, some of the struggles and some of the things about it. Um, I've, never, I've never tried to talk about anything except from my own experience um, because I think that it's, I would not be authentic otherwise. So I was like, okay, I can, do, I can do that. That's a topic I can do because I live it. So I said, okay. Um, and then last week, Lauren was announcing that I was going to do the talk of this week, and um, I forget it was him or somebody said something like, you know, what, so what's it going to be about, or what's the title, or whatever, so I just threw it out there. Well, things I've learned living with Lauren, and I just kind of threw it out there randomly, uh, I didn't really think about it, and it wasn't really my, my working title at the time, um, but several people, like, like, latched onto that, and they, and they, you know, spoke to me about it after the service, and it, so, so it kind of seemed like a good idea, so, that was sort of my working title um, all week long as I was thinking about it. Um, and then in the end I sort of have a slightly different title that I'm going to get to in a little while. Um, I had a lot of trouble putting this one together. Um, one of the things that I have learned in the past, oh, let's say five years, since the last time I've spoken, um, is that you don't have to know the end game to get started with something. And that was a big lesson for me to learn. Um, because for me to get started and to do something, I've always felt like I had to have it all in my head first and to kind of know what the outcome was going to be and to have the variables controlled. Um, but I have learned that it doesn't have to be that way, that you can actually trust the process and if you can just get started on something, like it, can, you know, it can be anything almost, if you just get started on something and take those first steps, then the next steps kind of become clear, and the next steps become clear, and the steps after that become clear, and you get somewhere that's really worthwhile. You don't have to know where you're going all the time to be able to get there. That's Lauren's tagline, right? On his emails, not all who wander are lost. But I just made that connection. Um, so I thought, well, I really don't know where this is going to go. I, I, I've had like you know a whole bunch of different thoughts and different ideas and things I could include and ways to approach it. Um, but no sense, really, of how it's all going to come together. So I said, well, I've learned this really good lesson. I've applied it in a number of different areas. I'm going to apply it, and I'm going to trust the process. So I kind of dug in all week long and you know, spent lots of time thinking and a little bit of time on the computer and kind of working it through. Um, deadline was drawing nearer, and I was at a party last night, so, so I really felt like Friday I had to I had to really pull it together because, you know, Saturday was not going to cut it. Um, so Friday night, I'm, I'm there and I'm at my computer again. Um, I'm, I'm still writing notes and kind of thinking all these things through. And I'm not, I'm not feeling it. I am not feeling that, that moment where you kind of go, ah, oh, here's, here's how it's going to come together. Here's how it's going to crystallize. Here's how it's going to become a package. Um, and I was a little bit annoyed because, hello, it's supposed to. I've learned this lesson now. It's happened to me several times. I use it when teaching and doing all sorts of things. Why is it not working for me this time? So I'm sitting there, kind of frustrated, but still knowing that I have this talk to do. So um, working at it, and I started thinking about a video clip that I had seen about a year and a half ago. Um, the girl in the in the video clip she does this little this little talk. I don't know if any of you are familiar with TED Talks. Um, the 830 know who he was, but it, maybe some of you, yeah, TED Talks. If you don't know TED Talks and you're interested kind of in hearing different ideas and there are all different topics and a variety of things you can, you can look up, um, but they're really, really interesting. They're, they can range from like, you know, three minutes to 20 minutes, but um, there are a lot of different cool topics. Anyways, I had come across this one by a girl named Brene Brown. And in this talk, she kind of tells her story of how she got to, um, you know, where 
where she is, and she labels herself, defines herself as a researcher storyteller. And she started out doing a bachelor's degree and then a master's degree in social work, um, which were fairly messy, fairly messy topics, um, big and broad and um, often uncomfortable. And um, she really, she really was interested in all those things and interested in how human beings relate and how you know family systems work and how people relate to each other. Um, but then one day she was sitting in a class, um, a research, more of a research methods class, and the professor said, um, if you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. We can debate that statement. But for her, this was very exciting because she was really interested in all these things, these kind of how people, you know, bounce off each other, connect or don't connect, and all of this, but, but, but she, she wasn't satisfied with that. She, she wanted to put order to it. She said, ha! Huh? This is how I'm going to do it. I studied these topics, and now I'm going to. So she she kind of dove, dove into it and had a few kind of aha moments along the way. And I'll let you Google the talk and watch it for yourself. Um, <coughs> but after doing a lot of uh, research and a lot of different things in um, asking sort of the questions of how people relate to each other and why some people thrive and some people don't um, in different in, in the same circumstances, um, and her big thing that she came out of that with um, is connection that human beings, as human beings, we are wired for connection. That that is why we are here. That that is the driving force, whether we know it or not. Whether we're working towards connection, or we're struggling against connection. Um, the essentials of what we're doing, that, that is, the, that is the, the driving force. That is the common thread. So that got me thinking about um, uh, a time, six-ish maybe years ago, when I felt quite smug, I had my own little aha moment. Um, I was talking with some people and I was kind of bantering back and forth, and it wasn't really a deep conversation, it was a little bit, you know, whatever. And, and somebody threw out there, oh, well, what's the meaning of life anyway? And I said, without really even thinking, what well, meaning of life? You learn to love God, love each other, love yourself. And then I was like, oh, I didn't know I knew that. I have an answer to that age old question. I know what we're supposed to be about. And I felt a little bit, you know, huh, I really can't figure that one out. Then I started thinking about it a bit more and realized, oh, really, that's not a very new thought. Um, love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Um, this is the first of great commandments, second of life unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Um, Jesus said it first. I cannot take the credit. Um, but 2,000 years later, it's still the theme in a talk like Brene Brown was doing for these TED Talks. Um, it's about connection. This is interesting because I did this talk at the 8:30 and it took too long. So I'm trying, I'm trying to contract a little bit. Um, and I just skipped a thought in my head, so it just made me hiccup. So sorry about that. Um, but connection, connection is the big, is the big thing. Um, she um, then the question, of course, is how. So how do we do this? How do we do connection um, or not? And her um, summary statement is that in order for connection to happen, we have to allow ourselves to be seen. Really see. How do you do that? Um, the word that she uses is a word that we all know and has a lot of baggage attached often, but the word that she uses is vulnerability. So, what does vulnerability mean to her? How does she define it? She talks about taking risks, she talks about reaching out, being, the first, being willing to be the first person to say hello, first person to say how are you, first person to say I love you, not knowing whether or not you're going to get a hello back or an I love you back. Um, being, being willing to um, look honestly at yourself and at someone else um, and being okay with that, being okay with it when it's messy. Um, to her that is vulnerability. It is vulnerability. I am not good at vulnerability. I made this discovery not that long ago actually. I am not crying yet, which is like awesome. Already at the age of I was crying. So I'm like, wow, I'm, I'm not crying yet. Am I still doing a good job? I don't know. But um, um, I am not good at vulnerability. I, this was um, a wake up and a change in my self understanding because I always sort of felt that I was kind of an upfront kind of person, that I was pretty, pretty kind of an open book um, for the most part. Um, Maybe, and partly because I cry a lot. I'm not afraid to cry. I, it, I don't know, kind of started in grade 8. And, <laughs> and never really, really stopped. Um, but um, recently, a 
few months ago, I realized being emotional does not equal being vulnerable. And that I'm not good at vulnerability. So why am I not good at vulnerability? I'm not good at vulnerability for a lot of the same reasons that we all find it difficult um, to be vulnerable. Um, you know, I have some lessons that I have learned and taken on board um, in life. Um, one is protect myself from um, pain, from being hurt, from being let down, from being tromped on, from, you know, all sorts of things. And fear um, gets in the way of vulnerability. Um, not feeling good enough, I'm not unique. I don't pretend to be. We all have felt that way. Um, not feeling worthy, not feeling um, like the insides are, are, are good enough. Um, and there's shame involved with that. And shame gets in the way of vulnerability. There's the feel of falling short, um, feel of fear, fear of failure, fear that if I take the risk, I won't do it right. Um, failure gets, fear of failure gets in the way of vulnerability. So I'm not good at vulnerability. Um, in general, and as I kept thinking about it, I thought, well, there's some areas in my life where I'm actually very good at making connection with people. There are, in some ways, that I'm very successful at that. So how come, how come in some ways I am, and in some ways I'm not? Um, and I, I had to conclude, as I looked at where I feel I do make connection with people, um, that I'm, I'm successful wherever I am in a very clear role, where my role is very defined. Um, I feel successful often, nothing at 100%, but I feel successful often making connection with people as a minister's wife. Um, again, I'm not perfect at it, but I, I, I do a good job of drawing people in when they, when they come in the door. And I do a good job of asking people those first questions. I'm not afraid to, um, to, to tell my story um, kind of in a general way and to ask for, for, for the story in, in return. Um, and that, that, that does create a level of connection. Um, I make connection as a musician, um, no question. Um, I'm confident in the role, I'm confident in my ability, um, I'm confident that I possess a lot of knowledge and skill, and when I do music, I know it does make a connection. Now music is a, is a sort of feeling level thing, and, and we often connect with music, but, um, but we won't connect with music unless, truly, unless it's being, being done in a way that really is vulnerable. When I wrote that song that we were saying before, before I started, um, I wrote it, as I said, when I was doing my very first talk, um, I guess you could say, and it was a vulnerable song to write. But I was okay with writing it, and I'm okay with putting it out there, because I do it from a position of, of strength, from a position of, of, of solid ground. I know who I am as a musician, and I, and I know where my strengths are. I have weaknesses too, but I know, I know where the weaknesses are. And, I know, and, and so I, I can accept it as a whole, um, the good and the bad. And because of that, I connect with people. And I know I do, because people have, have said that to me over the years many, many times, and it's a privileged position to be in. I know I also make a connection um, in my life. I make connection as a teacher. I taught piano for 15 years. Um, I know what it's like to connect with a student at the piano. Um, talk about a privileged position, being one-on-one -on -one as a teacher. It's not like being in front of a classroom. Um, but I've had that experience too in the last year of uh, working as a substitute teacher and being in front of a classroom. Sometimes they're a group that I'll see several times, sometimes I might only see them once um, in my whole life. Um, but to be successful in that role um, in the classroom, I have to connect with the kids. Um, there are all sorts of levels of connection for sure, but and in some way and, and somehow I have to connect with them. And I do that, and I think I do that because, again, I feel confident in my skill and my ability and in where I'm at, even though I have a zillion to learn, that's okay with me because I, I feel like I have a, a grapple on it, even though there are lots of holes in the Swiss cheese and there's lots of things still to learn and experiences to have. Um, so as I was thinking about this and thinking about connection, where does it happen, where does it happen, where doesn't it happen, 
I thought about something that has come up a few times in sermons, so some of you might uh, warn sermons, so some of you might recognize it. Um, you can also Google it. I tried last night just to see, and um, totally, totally can. Um, the I it and the I thou. It's a philosophy, a part of a philosophy of a, of a man named Martin Huber, late 1800s, first half of the 1900s, um, philosopher, uh, worked in the Zionist movement as well, um, and uh, in, the, in the Jewish community. And he, were, he, he did a lot of philosophizing and thinking about connection and the ways people relate to each other. And his, his kind of um, summary <coughs> theory was the I it and the I thou. That when we encounter someone, when two people encounter each other, there's kind of two ways, and I'm simplifying it, obviously, but there's kind of two ways that, that, that it's going to go. It's either going to go as an I-it or an I-that. And in the I-it, we bring to that encounter all of our, um, our own baggage, our own expectations, our own labels, our own um, things we're dealing with. And we treat that person based on based on our expectations, based on um, who we think they are, who we think they should be. Um, we treat them as an object, objectifying. And then we do that a lot. We do that a lot. We do it a lot every single day. Um, and he and he says that when you do an I it encounter, um, really it's a monologue. No matter who's talking, really you're only talk you're talking from yourself or express communicating from yourself. Whereas an I thou, you enter the experience uh, or the opportunity for connection. Um, you are who you are, that doesn't go away, but you but you are open <coughs> to finding out or understanding or hearing where the other person is coming from without kind of laying a whole bunch of stuff on top of it. Um, and he says that is when a dialogue actually happens. That is when connection actually happens. Um, so I had to come to the conclusion that on this topic that Lauren asked me to speak about, um, in this area of my life, I am having difficulty coming up with good points of connection. Because I am not at a place of feeling worthy, not that I have to be perfect or have it all figured out, because um, in the places where I do feel confident, I don't, um, but I don't feel like I have a handle on, on it, um, and I am not accepting of who I am in the face of this reality that we live every day. So what was I to do? Because if I'm going to do a talk like this, I'm going to do it, and my goal is going to be to connect, and if I don't, then I kind of feel like I've wasted my time and I've wasted yours. So what, what to do? I could talk about something else, something else that where I feel confident. I could talk about teaching. I've only been, you know, substitute teaching for a year. Um, I've got lots of stories and I've got lots of ideas and I've got lots of things I could tell. I could do, I could do a whole talk on that um, or, you know, myriad other things. But I knew that that would be a cop out. And I knew that I had to try and see if an angry, kind of messy person could still make a connection, and do a good job. So here I am. Um, my working title that we threw out last week was, you know, Things I've Learned with Living with Born. And I thought, well, if I'm going to be successful, I'm going to have to impose some sort of structure on this because I have 100,000 thoughts and 100,000 you know, possibilities, and, and it's all a big messy soup. So I'm going to have to impose some structure on it um, so that I can, in that way, get a handle on things. So I thought, well, five things. I have learned living with and that's in our family. And then I thought, well, that's a little presumptuous because really they're not necessarily things that I have learned. They kind of more things maybe I've learned, but really am learning. So I'm like, well, five things I am learning. And then I thought, well, you know what, really that's presumptuous too, because in some areas I don't even feel like I'm learning. I feel like I'm just kind of wading through. So learning isn't working for me. So like dealing with, but that's kind of lame. Um, and then I thought, well, five things I'm struggling with, but that gave a wrong connotation too, because I don't want it to be um, things that I'm dealing with that's like like Atlas with the world on, or the sky on his shoulders, holding it up, and like, oh, am I gonna make it? Like that's, because that's not really the feeling that I have either. And then I came up with the word grappling. Five things I'm grappling with, and I felt comfortable with that, because I'm a scrapper, I'm a fighter, I 
fight something, I fight, 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 if I'm not fighting with it, I'm probably not dealing with it, um, and then I might win or I might lose, um, but in both cases that, that can be okay, but, but I am, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fighter. And so, grappling, five things I'm grappling with. I felt like that was a word that was not loaded with a lot of expectation one way or the other. I'm still not crying. That's really, that's pretty impressive. Um, so, short history, because most of you know um, the history of, of, um, of, you know, how MS has been a part of our, our lives, but some of you don't. So, very short history. Warren was diagnosed about 13 or 14 years ago. Um, we were either engaged or about to be somewhere right around there. We've been married for 12 years. Um, one of the um, interesting points about that, when he was diagnosed, um, was that we had a conversation that was important for Lauren particularly to have a conversation that was basically, are you still in? Um, I knew I was marrying an old guy. This was not news. This was right up front, right from the beginning. Um, there's things that come along with that, um, issues that come along in any relationship. Um, but from now on, I was marrying an old guy who was also deceased. And was I still in? And it's a horrible conversation to have to have. And you wonder how, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously very close to him, but I don't know how it felt for him to have that, to have to ask that question. It must be very, very difficult. I was talking to, um, I was talking to another person uh, just recently last week, um, a lady who has MS, um, and she said that she was diagnosed two weeks before they were getting married. She was getting married to her husband. And she was telling me about having this conversation with her then to be husband um, and saying to him, like, are you sure? You know, like, do you really? I mean, and in a way, in a way, platitude, nobody knows what's coming. I mean, anything can happen at any time. But um, it's a hard place to be in, to sort of say, in this way, in, in, in this area, we know what's coming. You know, and are you still willing, you still willing to take it on? Obviously for her, for me, and for us. Um, of course, the answer was yes. Um, that's not a straightforward thing to do. Um, in the first um, number of years that we were married, there wasn't an enormous impact on our life um, because of MS. Lauren might tell the story somewhat differently. He's the one living in the body um, and having to deal with it every day. But for me, um, the biggest impact in those first number of years was um, what is a very common, like, you don't have a mess without having it, um, is, is really extreme fatigue and, and, and feeling tired um, a lot, a lot of the time. And it, it doesn't sound like a big deal, fatigue, like, don't take a nap, you'll be fine. Um, but when it's, when it's that pervasive and, and that, that present, um, it's very heavy. It's a very heavy thing to have to deal with because everything is sort of Hinged with the question mark, you know, is there enough energy for this today? Is there going to be enough energy to do what we thought about, what we planned, what we, what we, what we wanted to do? Um, and it's, it's hard on him, and it's hard on me. Um, that was the biggest thing for the first number of years. And really, it's only in the last few years where the mobility has become an issue. Um, and it's a big one, no surprise. There, so he's going to be like, wow, there's a revelation. But, um, there's a lot of stress that comes along with that, with um, having limited mobility. And, um, yeah, I'm trying not to go on for as long as it be a 30 second to stop there. Um, so, that's my short history. Um, and I, after thought, much thought, uh, boiled it down to many of my things going on in my brain to five things that I'm grappling with. So the first one that I thought I would share was I am grappling with being that family. I, um, this past summer, we uh, just started using the wheelchair for the first time. Um, uh, the very first time was going to a soccer game. And I would like to say that I was a pillar, you know, of strength. But really, I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed because nobody wants to be Kind of look at me, here I am. And you know, a lot of people already know that you want to MS anyway. And 
it felt like, even though I know people were not looking at us that way, it felt like, I got some in my pocket, don't worry. Thanks, Graham. She's <laughs> taking care of me since I was born. Absolutely. Um, it felt like, um, oh, well, look at them. You know, like they think that, you know, we all know that they have MS and now they're going to use the wheelchair and it's, you know, so obvious and it, it kind of feels like showy. I don't, I don't know how to explain it in a different way. Um, it just feels like trying to put a knee on sign and, and, you know, everybody has their struggles and I don't need to broadcast the fact that we have a struggle. But when you have a wheelchair, that's, you're, you're pretty much broadcasting it. So I feel embarrassed to be in that family. I feel embarrassed going to um, the welcome corn roast at Ben's school. And, you know, more than I like, not knowing where do we park. I don't know, where should we park that's good? We don't want to be in the way. Um, but we don't want to seem like we're not, you know, interested in what's going on. Um, it's a weird feeling to um, have to wait for people to come to you. Um, I mean, one could wheel around, but then that would be even more kind of, you know, showy or I, I don't know what. Um, so you have to wait for people to come to you. And it's awkward, you know, and we're looking at um, Christmas Fair at Ben's School is coming up on Saturday, and it's a crazy day, but we all want to all be there. Um, but you know what, I've already talked to people, how are we going to handle it? How, you know, what's the, the plan going to be? It's like, well, you could come in the scooter, obviously, because that makes the most sense. And, um, you know, park somewhere, maybe in the lunch, you know, room area or whatever. And, and um, you know, I'll take the kids all around and then you can you know, kind of be on base there down, down, down where he is. And, and you just know, even, even though, even though nobody's thinking bad, you don't want to be defined that way. Nobody does want to be defined by one thing. And it's uncomfortable to think that people will be looking at that and being like, oh yeah, that's them. Oh yeah, remember last year we did the MS Reading Bond? He's, yeah, good luck with that. Um, um, in the same 10 minutes. Um, I'm only on number one, I have five. Um, um, it, it's, it's, off, it, it, it's awkward. You know, he's the one that did the talk at the Reading Bond last year. You know, that's them. And, and you feel like, and, and, and I do it all the time to other people in other ways. And it, it's the I, it thing. You think you have them figured out. You know, you kind of have them in a, in a, in a little compartment. And it, it's not meant to be limiting, but it kind of is. And we kind of, you know, we, we, we all take in so much input all the time. And, and we have to categorize it somehow. We have to make sense of it and filter it and, and do those things. But I don't want to be in the MS filter. That's not the disease family, you know? Like, that's not how I, or Lauren, want to be defined. And so that's hard to deal with. Um, I have to be careful because I did read people on the 830, so I, I don't want to go on too long this time. But now I'm crying, so it's real, right? So it's all good. You can reach the goal. No, I'm just kidding. Um, very much. Um, so, moving forward to the next thing. Um, I'm kind of linked with this, kind of linked with this, how people kind of react to it and how they respond to it. Um, some people do ask um, how things are. Usually people ask how Lauren is. Um, for me, I'm talking just, you know, for me, how Lauren is. And in some ways that's kind of a safe question um, to ask me, sort of, because it can be sort of clinical. You know, how's it doing? It's usually the way, way it's phrased. Um, very few people ask me how I'm doing. Um, some people do, and I'm sure a lot of people think it, but very few people actually do. Um, even fewer people, interestingly, as I was thinking about this, and I was kind of surprised by it, and I need to think about it more, um, even fewer people ask me how the kids are doing, which is interesting. And um, again, I'm sure people think about it, but, but, but even fewer ask. Um, the truth is, I kind of wish people would ask more, especially when it's clearly in the air. You know, I don't need people to ask me so I can bleed all over them. But when, when it's very obviously kind of a bit of an elephant between whoever I'm speaking to, I would rather it be named than not. 
um, I would rather have an opportunity to make a connection and do an I vow than do an I get. Um, however, and this brings me to my next thing, number two, um, of the people who do ask, most do it from a good place, not all. Most do it from a good place. But many ask, but are not ready to hear the answer. Um, I have two categories in my, in my, in my thinking um, of how people will respond who are not comfortable with it, um, with, with, with the true answer, an honest answer. There's the people who um, come back with the platitudes. Uh, oh, the scientists are working so hard, there's so many new findings, you know, they're going to find it here. They're working on it every day. Good, let me know, you know, how that goes. Um, it's, you know, it's so important though to focus on the positive, you know, you have two beautiful children and, you know, a wonderful family. I know that, you know, this is not news. Um, focus on the positive. Sure, it doesn't in any way <coughs> diminish or take away from the negative. Um, somebody actually said this to Lori, not to me, but could easily have gone the other way. Um, well, you know, you know, I know you're dealing with this MS, but there are a lot of people with that MS who have it a lot worse than you. So that's, you know, you know, thank you for that. Well, I suppose, and if it makes you feel better to tell me that, then okay. Um, but everyone's. Um, Life is theirs to live, uh, and, and putting that kind of platitude puts like a nice little bow. And really, the purpose of it is to make the other person feel better. It, um, and I understand where it comes from. It's hard to deal with it. It's hard to deal with it sucking for more and for us that he has a mess. It's hard to just kind of accept that, but it does. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't. It doesn't matter how many wonderful things are in our life, and there are many, many wonderful things. It doesn't change the sucky things. And it doesn't change that we have this disease to deal with. The other um, response that I get, and again, often from very well-meaning and well-intentioned people, and I know they care, some don't, but most of them really care and are doing it from their heart, is the problem solvers. Well, you should talk to so-and-so. Or, I have a strategy. Or, there's this website you should check out. And, their kind of solution to dealing with the discomfort of it sucking that our family has to deal with this disease is to try to fix it. Um, and just like there's no real way to put a bow on it and make it look pretty, there's no way to fix it. Unless, even if, even if you were the scientist that came up with the cure, there's no way to fix what we have already experienced and, and kind of what we're going to experience moving forward. So I always know, know that it's well meant, um, but at the same time, it's in the context of a conversation that started with how are you, that problem solving just would be problem solving leaves me feeling unheard. Um, they're gonna all the kids are gonna all come in and it's gonna be like, I told you ten minutes, but anyway. Um, I need to tell you the story anyway. This um, this time at, so at soccer when we were there for the first time with the wheelchair, um, Annie's coach. Um, you know, saw us arrive, and uh, he came over and didn't really know him very well. He like, only a few weeks really into soccer, and um, so he came, you know, hi, you know, how's it going, whatever. And um, he said, "Deal with the chair," you know. He didn't know anything. Like he would seen more like with a stick, and like obviously struggling with, to walk and stuff. But he didn't know anything. So we, you know, we said a little bit, you know, well, you know, diagnosed with MS about 12 years, you know, 15 years ago, whatever, and mobility has become an issue. It's hard to get to soccer, you know, uneven terrain, and it, it makes walking even more difficult. And so, you know, if he wants to be here, really, we, we realize we need to use the chair. And he cut, you know, he listened and, and kind of nodded or whatever, and he took it all in, and he was like, you should have a beer about that sometime. And it was, like, hands down, the best reaction that either of us had ever had. Because it didn't, it didn't try, it didn't try to finesse it. It didn't try to fix it. It just heard it and said, "If you need me to hear more, I'd be happy to." It was an I thou moment. And we hardly know this guy. We still don't really know this guy. Maybe they'll have a beer sometime. Maybe they won't. Um, it doesn't really matter. 
Um, now I've made you all like afraid not to ask me how I am and afraid to ask me how I am. I realize that. Um, but most of you have also known me since I was 16, so I'm leaving it to you to figure it out. Um, number three, I was worried that um, at this point I will have sounded uh, really way too like negative and whiny and complaining about the world around me. And so I just thought I'd turn it around a little bit and let you know that one of the big things, number three, that I grapple with is I am not as nice as I'd like to be. I wish I would have gotten nicer. Um, in the spring, in the spring, um, there was a man, he came to a few of our concerts, he was from Bavalis, his name was Ray. Um, he was a lovely, lovely man. Um, in the last portion of his life, I'm not sure over how many decades it's been, but he, he lost his sight, um, and by the end he, he, he was blind. Um, he passed away in the spring, and we had the memorial service here, and a whole of the workers at Pavalis, and we've been friends with Ray for a very long time, did one of the um, eulogies. And one of the things she said was that Ray never complained about his condition, about not being able to see, that he never complained. And I thought, wow. Nobody's going to say that if my throat open. Because whether you have heard it particularly or not, I complain in my head and out loud, that's more, all the time. Um, there are some things one can't do. He can't empty the dishwasher, not unless I want to buy a new set of dishes every month. Um, he can't cut his nails or the kids' nails because um, there would be blood. Uh, he can't do the vacuuming because he would fall over. He can't set up the time trailer, same reason, or make the leaves. He can't stop at the store on his way home from a meeting. He doesn't have uh, the energy and the mobility to do that. Um, the, the list could go on and on. There are a lot of things that Warren just can't do, which means that I do them. The things that he can't do, they make me mad, for sure. They make me mad kind of in the universe. Um, mad at God, uh, mad at disease. Um, or just kind of a generalized kind of mad. Um, but they're not impossible for me to take on. I, I, I kind of do it, and I grumble a little inside, and I'm like, well, look, like you can't do it. So like, what are you going to do? Suck it up, sister. Um, then there are things that Lauren can do, but are easier for me to do, which really is all of life. Um, one of the big ones is fetching. Um, I'm a fetcher. I'm trying to teach my children that they know how to get a glass of water, they can get it themselves. But when daddy asks mommy for a glass of water, even though he's sitting five feet away, she'll do it for him. I'm a fetcher, you know. It's easier and quicker for me to type up a letter than it is for Morn to type up a letter. It's easier for me to do up his buttons, even though he can, he can use his little buttonhole and his OT thing. It takes him five minutes, it'll take me ten seconds. Um, he can cut his food, but you know, if I just cut it when I'm cutting up the kids, it's really a lot easier. Um, did I mention I'm the fetcher? I'm the fetcher. This one is really big for me. And I would like to say that I am gracious about it. But more often than not, I am not gracious about it. I wish I had a shame. For sure. I wish I was a better person. I wish I was nicer. I wish I could do it with a smile on my face and a song in my heart. And I resent it. I really do. You know, if I was a single mom, okay, good up sister. I'm not. I have a great husband and beautiful children, and I should not have to do everything by myself. And I don't do everything by myself. But there are a lot of times when it feels like it does. And I am not um, holding about it. <laughs> um, maybe in five years, if I get to talk again, I'll be able to say that I've come to a better place. And then I'm nicer, um, more gracious, and more holy in this area. I hope so. Um, but I share it mostly because I think it's probably the same for most of us. Um, and so just for you to know that if, if you do feel that way, you're not alone. Um, number four. Kids aren't in yet. That's good. I have two more. Um, number four. I grapple with the opportunity cost of having a disease in our family. I learned about the concept of opportunity cost when it was either grade 10 or grade 11 economics, Ms. Bleedis and John Reddy. And it was um, a, an economic concept that you know she taught us that is uh, just very, very basically, if you spend your $10 on that, you're not spending it on an infinite number of other things. 
this is very kind of obvious and straightforward. Um, but for me, it really, it really impacted me <coughs> as being so true of so many things. And all through, like since, like since I'm 17, like, like well before I ever, you know, thought about Warren or MS or any of these things. Um, that's been in my mind um, as kind of a theme. Um, MS has a huge opportunity cost. There's the physical opportunity cost. Um, he has limited, um, limited mobility, which means there are things that he just doesn't do. Um, my kids are in the room now, so I'm going to be careful, but there are a lot of things that he would like to do that he can't. Um, we went to things like you on Friday. We had a great time, right Ben? Yeah. Yeah, but it was too bad that Dad didn't come. Because um, he has called him tubes, but not anymore. Um, there are a lot, a lot, a lot of things like that. And in the interest of time and children in the room, I would contract it, but there's a lot of opportunity cost to not being able to move around. Um, and you think, oh, well, you know, certain places are accessible, and you know, you can bring a scooter. Yeah, it makes, it makes a difference. Um, we all went to the treating together, and that was great um, because of the scooter. But there are a lot of things that we just don't do, and we won't be able to do, or that he won't be able to participate in. There's also a very big mental energy opportunity for us. And this one is really, really, really big. This one um, I think about a lot, I grapple with a lot. Um, we live in a body that is compromised um, the way that Warren does. There is a lot of time and mental energy and focus that gets spent on dealing with it, thinking about it, trying to anticipate how things are going to be, um, you know. How did, how did it go going up the stairs, you know, blow by blow? Um, is he going to be able to get into the shower today by himself, or am I going to have to lift his leg? We talk about it all the time. We talk about arrangements all the time. And we talk about, you know, or, and, and more talks about, you know, different body parts and how they're feeling all the time. And I often wonder, what would we be talking about if we weren't talking about that? If we add up all the hours that we spend thinking about, planning for, talking about, dissecting, Analyzing, trying to deal with all of that, what would we be talking about and, and doing instead? It has a cost. It has a price tag. I'm going to leave that one there. Um, the very last one that I wanted to mention, hopefully I'll get it in before the kids get crazy. It really is the last one. It's okay. Um, uh, yeah, we're still kind of okay with time uh, overall. Um, we're going to have to keep track of it again. Lots of little legends are um, But um, faith. I grapple with faith. A lot. Um, uh, not this past March, but the March before. Um, and I was going to sort of give you the catalyst and stuff, but we can talk about that sometime out um, if you're interested. Um, but I took a few days and I went to visit Kyle in Toronto. And I went by myself and I was in the car by myself. And this is a great place to be if you need to yell. It's fantastic because nobody can hear you. You're not bothering anybody. You're kind of doing what you need to do anyway, so it's multitasking even. Um, but you can do a lot of screaming and yelling in a car um, driving to Toronto. Um, and, and, and I did. I did do a lot of that. And I was very angry. And um, there was, I just, there was a part of me, and, and, and I wish I could describe more clearly the actual kind of process of how it happened, but I'm not really even sure, to be honest. Um, I kind of decided to sort of say, you know, like the God thing? I don't really feel like it's helping me out. I'm just going to, I'm just going to kind of take it out for a while. And I did, and there was a few things that really kind of responded, took me by surprise. One was how easy it was, how easy it was to let it go. How easy it was to stop um, intentionally, you know, trying to pray, trying to talk to God. How easy it was to let those thoughts that I had kind of automatically directed upwards, quote unquote, all the time, to just stop doing that. It was easy. It was also surprising to me how many holes it left behind. And I've always struggled with feeling not good enough as a Christian, and I am not a disciplined kind of person. I have never had a prayer life where I know I pray, you know, half an hour every day and read my Bible every day. Like, never, never, never. And I've always felt like, like, if only I could do that, that I would, you know, get the relationship with God thing better. And, you know, if you want to have a relationship with someone, you spend time with them, and, blah, blah, blah. and I've always felt um, like I was not very good at that. 
And so I was surprised when I let it all go how many holes there were. How many places and areas which I had been filling with God. And so even though I don't really recommend it as a strategy, it kind of really helped me learn um, where God was present in my life. Um, so to deal with all of this, some of you knew me before, most of you did, some of you didn't. Um, but I um, lost 40 pounds in the last uh, while. And uh, it was right at that time, right at that time that I'm talking about, that I picked up my iPod and started to walk. And everybody wants to know, you know, how did you lose the 40 pounds about the magic diet and the magic pill and all of that? And it's like, well, you know, get a disease, give up on God, get an iPod, and you're good. Like, just go for that. Um, you know, it doesn't work for everybody. But, um, so I did. I did a lot of walking and it had great benefits. Um, and it was also cheaper than therapy, so that was good. Um, and then in the fall of the following year, so like last fall, a year ago, I started writing my prayers on the computer. Um, I'm always at the computer anyway, and I thought, well, you know, I'm just going to try. And I'm not going to try to make it a good prayer. I'm just going to kind of like, you know, vomit on the computer. You know, metaphorically speaking. Um, and so I did that, and it, and it did kind of help, and it, and it did kind of, it did kind of bring things kind of back. But I've had to realize, and this is something I'm grappling with, so I do not have a bottom line here or a punchline. Um, I think, I think I've always treated God as an I did. I think I've had an understanding of who He is, and who I should be in relation to Him. Um, and then I never really get open to an I And I just learned from Brene Brown that the key to the I vow is the vulnerability. And still it's a mess in my brain. I'm still, I'm not sure how all the little bits come together. So maybe if in five years I get to talk again, I'll be able to tell you that I've worked some of this out and I'll be able to give you um, one of the answers. Um, but I'm still grappling with faith. Um, I have no pretty summary because the last thing that I want to do is put a nice platitude at the end to make everybody feel better about all the things that I have said, to make me feel better. Um, but what I really hope I really hope is, in the sort of messiness of it all, that I have made some connection um, for something for you. Um, because otherwise, I'm just indulging myself, and that is not my goal either. Um, I didn't think you would be back in the room, you know, this time, and I said it this way at the 832. My real conclusion is, and I don't say it just because it's in the room. But my real conclusion is, I'm very lucky to be married to somebody as nice as Torn. <laughs> he's a lot nicer than me. He's still young, you know, he's still getting back, he's still... It's not easier for him or better for him, but he's a lot more gracious and he puts up with a lot of CRNG for me. So I'm very lucky that I married someone as nice as Torn. And so I knew I wouldn't have a good summary or a good conclusion, so I figured I could allow myself at this point to go into a position of comfort and strength, and we could sing a song. I think we're good with that. So we will. Okay, stay seated. Actually, I tried to pick an appropriate song, and it does. Kind of sums it up. 